Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Lorelei and I'm from the Bluegrass State of Kentucky, which is the southeastern North American state along the west side of the Appalachian Mountains, bounded by the Ohio River, with Frankfort as our state capital and Louisville our largest city. Kentucky borders Virginia in the southeast and Tennessee to the south. I grew up on a horse farm in Kentucky along the old Frankfort Pike, which is considered one of America's most scenic drives and is a stretch of the HWY 1681, which runs from Lexington to Frankfort, where you'll see extravagant mansions, rock fences and very old statuesque trees. I grew up in the 1980s and was raised on an exquisite-looking horse farm on about 340 acres of verdant grassland, sectioned off by pretty wooden poled fencing. It was here where my father raised foals and produced racehorses, as well as providing boarding facilities for horses. So you could say that my parents were both mad about horses, but you'd have to be if you run a horse farm, as having a fervent passion for horses is a prerequisite for the job, and my parents were very partial towards thoroughbreds. Some of the horses that we raised were prime specimens and remarkable-looking animals, even if I say so myself. Our farm boasted a natural creek, a couple of ponds, a small wooded grove, paddocks, tack and feed rooms, foaling rooms, a round pen and lunging ring, and the list goes on and on. I grew up in a very grandiose, rather lavish-looking federal-style farmhouse with my older sister Natalie and very strict, punctilious parents. I gather our house was actually built in the colonial times and was a very large white two-storey home with a side gabled roof, large dramatic double-hung symmetrically placed windows with five windows on the second storey, light blue shutters and an elliptical fan light above our blue front door, as well as a decorative front entry porch with elegant curvings. I do remember growing up that my controlling father was very stiff upper lip, regimental, authoritarian and exceedingly disciplined so much so that our home became like a military barracks rather than a fun-loving, wholesome environment to raise kids. My pedantic father was meticulous in everything he did and expected us to apply the same scrupulous, efficient standards to our own young lives. He was a stickler for timekeeping, so as children we were expected to come downstairs for dinner looking impeccable, without a hair out of place, at 7pm sharp. If we were a minute late, there would be hell to pay – and we would ultimately be in big trouble and would be seriously reprimanded. We soon learnt to adjust, however. It would seem that even though my father was an iron-fisted disciplinarian, I'm glad to say that he certainly chose not to dictate our marital choices, which was his one saving grace, if indeed he had any at all. Nevertheless, he would draw a deep line in the sand and dig his heels in if he discerned in any way that our potential suitor did not have deep pockets, so to speak. Later that year, disaster was to strike our entire family when my father was riding. We knew something was wrong when a sheepish-looking Zoe returned to the paddocks without my father on her back. Luckily, my father died on impact by the massive injuries he sustained from the fall, and so I am heartily relieved 
and very grateful that he didn't suffer. The irony is that my father used to tell us that one day he would die after being thrown off a horse very violently. I mean, how did he even know this? My mother would reprimand him, telling him to stop being so ridiculous, and he would say, I've seen the fall in my dreams for many years now. It is going to happen one day, and you need to be prepared for it. You will be required to know how you will manage things once I'm gone. It seemed that his foreboding premonition had most certainly come true, but help was at hand in the form of my older cousin Robert, who was twenty-eight at the time and had been trained by my father to follow diligently in his footsteps. So it was a seamless transition as Robert moved into our family home, taking up residence with us and resuming the reins as man of the house, as well as managing our horse farm. This was such a relief for the all of us, as everything at home returned to normal. I can honestly say that I wasn't totally devastated about my father's untimely, unforeseen death, which I know sounds absolutely appalling for a daughter to concede, and I am desperately ashamed of feeling this way. I believe that my father's arbitrary, draconian child-raising methods and his stringent, oppressive rules meant that his death was almost a relief for the all of us, and even my mother blossomed and brightened into a brand new woman after he'd gone. I began to realise that even as his seemingly devoted wife, she had been as terrified by our dictatorial father as much as her own kids had been. I was to learn that people in the community at the time did respect and admire my father's work ethics and incredible professionalism. Yet despite all this, he was not well liked among many of the locals. Many people described him as a cantankerous, self-righteous, opinionated person that insisted on doing everything rigidly and strictly by the book. I believe all my life I had been so terrified of my father, and he was so emotionally disconnected to us as children, that there was no love lost between us, which in hindsight is desperately sad. Needless to say, I wore the battle wounds of years of being raised by him, and these extensive emotional scars were deeply entrenched in my psyche. If I was running late for anything, I would begin to hyperventilate and panic, and I would feel like a deer caught up in headlights. I could become so overwhelmed and overwrought that I have even been known to faint and pass out. Once my father had died, I felt like a bird that had been released from her gold-gilded cage, and it was like my clipped wings had suddenly grown back. My parochial father was very old school and quite chauvinistic. He believed that a woman's virtuous place was in the home, and never, ever in the workplace. I remember asking my mother how she'd feel about me applying for a job as a receptionist in the nearby town. I was bewildered and delighted when she proclaimed that she was not adverse to the idea at all. In fact, she actively encouraged it. I think it'll do you good, she told me, to get some work experience behind you. I know your father would have heartily disapproved, but he's not here now to interfere, so you can do what you like. I showed her the ad in the local paper, which read, Glamorous receptionist required for doctor's surgery three times a week to answer phone calls and to deal with clients. Must be well presented with excellent phone manner. That's right up your alley, my mother told me. Give them a call at once. And so it was arranged that my interview for the job would be on a Monday morning. Over that weekend, it poured and poured with a soaking rain, and by the Monday morning, things had cleared up considerably and I was heartily relieved. I thought it was a very good omen for my interview that the sun was now sparkling through the blue infirmament, and it was an exquisitely beautiful day. And so it was that I remember waking up in a frantic state with my heart pounding through my chest at a hundred miles an hour, as the same tape recording kept playing over and over again in my head, like a dull, throbbing, drumming headache that just wouldn't let up. You must not be late! You must not be late! You must not be late! This was ultimately what I went through night after night before dinner time in our home, when my dad was alive. I was so petrified of being late and being seriously reprimanded by a disapproving father, who always looked like an angry rottweiler whenever we let him down. I assure you that if looks could bite, he would have shredded me to pieces as such was the level of his incandescent rage. Lucky he didn't lay a finger on any of us, but that didn't make the emotional trauma any less brutal or significant. I hurriedly got dressed in a smart outfit with a belt and shoes and dashed out towards my red Ford Mustang like a bat out of hell, climbing into the car seat and starting up the engine vigorously. 
Calm down, dear, my mother assured me. You have plenty of time before your job interview. There's no need to rush. You really do look phenomenal in that smart dress of yours. Anyone would be crazy to turn you away. Good luck with the interview, dear. Not that you're going to need it, of course, she said, kissing me gently on both of my cheeks. My mother watched me as I drove down our long driveway, past the fields of grazing horses, where I turned to the right down a few obscure dirt roads, in order to take a shortcut. But that was the worst decision I could have ever made in the circumstances, as the recent rain had turned the roads into a slippery, muddy bath, well suited for a pot-bellied pig, but most certainly not for my car. My poor Mustang was fighting to steady herself and was precariously sliding all over the place and had completely lost traction. I pressed my foot down hard on the accelerator, but it made matters infinitely worse. All of a sudden my car ground to a standstill, and before long I was completely trapped in the mud. I began to panic and hyperventilate as sweat started pouring down my face profusely, almost as if it was raining heavily, as even my hair became soaked. I staggered out of the car and tried my level best to pull the Ford Mustang out of the mud, but it was to no avail, as I really didn't have the human strength to do it. And I needed someone really strong, probably a machine or something to help me in this situation, but it didn't stop me from trying nevertheless. Little did I realise that my cake was now soaked with mud, but so were my formal leather shoes. I began to scream and scream at the top of my lungs. No! No! Please, God, no! Why does this have to happen now? It's not fair! Oh, no! No! I began to scream and scream at the top of my lungs. Oh, I was just so pent up with emotion, and my high-pitched voice must have travelled for miles around. I was so enraged that I lashed out at my car, blaming it for what had happened to me. I was kicking and slapping it like an angry, petulant kid. And then the heavens opened from my tear ducts, and I began to sob and sob. Oh, no! No! I felt so completely helpless, powerless and debilitated. The idea of being late was so overwhelming for me. I could hear my father's words echoing in my head like a resounding bell. Never, ever be late, as it is the epitome of discourteousness and impudence. In those days, we did not have mobile phones, so I couldn't call for any kind of help. I knew that if I trekked laboriously back to my own house, I would be running very late and would almost certainly miss the interview. I could not even get my car tyres out of this mud, so either way, I was stuck. I was running out of any choices. Once again, I let out a scream of frustration as the gripping terror of running late just completely overwhelmed me. All of a sudden I heard what I can only describe as a thundering booming sound that caused the ground to vibrate like a steam train on full throttle coming towards me. I think I was way too bemused and overawed to even react. It was then that I saw them, and words fail me to describe what I saw. For never in all my born days did I know that critters like this could actually exist in our reality. One appeared to be male, the other female, as she had a pair of small hair-covered breasts, but I could not discern what on earth they were, for they seemed to be like ape men. I think the sheer size of these creatures is what beheld my all the most, for they were gargantuan in width, height and weight, and were larger than grizzly bears, and I promise you that's true. I would ascertain that even a grizzly would be intimidated by these extraordinary beasts. These eight-foot ape men were very human-like, but they were completely covered with long flowing hazelnut hair with auburn and blonde highlights, with the exception of their faces, which were a dark nut brown colour and were completely hairless. I noted that much like other primates, they also had overlong arms, which led me to conclude that although they were bipedal, they could easily run on four legs as well as two. I also noticed that they were ripped with dense muscle and were very sinewy, and they possessed very powerful shoulders and a cone-shaped head that simply sat on the shoulders with no apparent neck. The female's face was a lot more feminine than the male's and was long, while the male's face was very broad, but they both had golden-brown, deep-set eyes, flat noses, furrowed brow ridges and thin lips. For a moment I stared at the critters with eyes as round as saucers and my chin hanging to the ground in shock. 
The first thought that entered my mind was that I had to be dreaming, and this was not real. There was no way that this was real. Yet I knew in my heart of hearts that this was indeed no dream, nor was it a hallucination of any kind. This was real. I think shock metamorphosized into terror. I began to shake and wobble like an involuntary blamage jelly, as I was certain that this powerful critter, or these critters, so to speak, were seeing me as an easy meal, and in seconds I would be devoured as their prey. My mind was telling me to run away, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't understand why I seemed so incapacitated. And I could feel the beads of perspiration pouring down my face as I had broken into a cold sweat. I watched in absolute horror as the critters glided past me towards my mustang, and to my absolute amazement, they lifted it out of the muddy ditch as if it was a toy car. I've never seen such strength exhibited before, for what they did, a man could never have done. It was light work for them moving my car. Out of that muddy ditch, for a moment I was so jubilantly happy that I forgot my fear, and I began to laugh out loud. That was how thrilled I was. If I was quick, I could make it to my interview in time. The female critter turned around to look at me directly in the eyes, and we connected. She held my gaze for a moment, and I could tell that she was very kind and sympathetic towards my plight. And that she'd intended to help me all along, and that harm never even entered the equation. I believe she had responded to my screams. She pointed to my car, and I climbed into the seat and drove away, honking my horn to say thanks to the two hairy critters. I could see them standing there, watching me like two giants as I drove away. In those frantic moments, the only thoughts that I could get into my head were about the interview, and getting there on time. Now the anxiety came flooding black like a tsunami, and all I could think about was not being late at any cost. I quickly parked my car in the parking bay and hurried through the glass doors towards the reception counter to announce my arrival. I remember wringing my hands in delight. I was thrilled. I couldn't believe that I had arrived at the interview on time. And my mind was far from thoughts about my dishevelled, muddy appearance. In fact, in truth, I'd completely forgotten about it. I was oblivious to the mascara stains down my cheeks and my muddy dress and shoes that were caked in mud. On the contrary, I'd not given them a second thought. All I felt at this moment was huge relief to have arrived on time, and in my inner world, that was all that really mattered. The trim, blonde, perfectly groomed receptionist gave me a disapproving once over, looking down on me as if I was a lower form of pond life. She beckoned for me to follow her and led me towards the interview room with a rarely pompous look on her face. I remember thinking to myself that I didn't like her at all, as she seemed a little hoity-toity and rather full of herself and her own sense of self-importance. Once a gentleman shook my hand. I noticed him staring down at my mud-soaked shoes with a look of absolute horror on his face, especially as the mud that I was trailing in was beginning to mark the white carpet. That was when I wanted the ground to swallow me up, because I was so embarrassed and too tongue-tied to explain my horrifying appearance. But luckily, he said nothing. I suddenly felt very self-conscious because I knew I didn't stand a chance of getting the job looking like this. I had observed three very smartly attired women, women waiting in line for their interview, and I knew that this man would never pick someone who took regular mud baths before the surgery opened its doors every morning. Thank you very much, Miss Markham. It has been a pleasure to meet you. We will be in touch in due course. Of course, I knew he never would be. When I returned home to tell my mother what had transpired, my mother got really mad at me. Lorelai, what on earth induced you to go driving down those mud roads, especially after all the rain we've been having lately? You really are a silly girl. I'm amazed you got the car out of the ditch. How that happened, God only knows. I was not about to tell her about the ape-like humanoids I'd encountered, whom had helped me out of my dreadful plight. If I was challenged into believing what I'd seen was in fact real, how in the world would my mother ever believe my incredulous account? 
It was highly doubtful that she would, so I kept my lips sealed in regards to that matter. You mean you went to the interview looking like that? said my cousin Robert, cracking up with laughter. You are kidding me. I can only imagine what they must have thought. Have you seen what you look like in that mirror? I know, I said. It was a complete waste of time. I don't know why I even bothered. I began to start crying. That's defeatist talk, said Robert. I know what we need to do, he said decisively. Go upstairs, get into the shower right now, and change into something smart, and meet me back at the car. Hurry, will you? Before long, I was back at the car, all neatly turned out, and Robert looked at me approvingly. That's more like it, he said. Now let's get going. And so it was, Robert parked his car outside the doctor's surgery and beckoned for me to follow him in, which I did so reluctantly. I was amazed to see a long line of women still waiting to be interviewed for the receptionist position. Robert added my name to the long line and the end of the list and sat with me in the waiting room. But I've already been interviewed, I explained. I can't go back in again. Yes, you can, said Robert. You get in there and tell them exactly why you came back and about your accident in the mud. You tell them why you want the job. I don't want any defeatist chatter from you. Do you understand? I nodded. There was no point in arguing with him. Pleased to meet you, Lorelei, said the interview, extending his hand. Your name is very familiar. Have we met? Yes, earlier this morning when I was racing to get here and ended up stranded on a muddy road with my tyres caught in the mud. I was so desperate to get to the interview on time, I didn't realise what an atrocious and sorry sight I looked. I'm here to show you that I am actually glamorous and would normally look the part for the receptionist's job if it were not for the unforeseen circumstances that I encountered on my way here. Feisty and very determined, with plenty of grit. I like it, said the interviewer. Young lady, I think you've got the job. You're just what we're looking for. But what about all the other people you have interviewed, I asked, looking shocked. Surely you can't just announce that I've got the job just like that. I can do anything I like. You're just the right person that's come along. Congratulations. I'm very glad you came back. Because the sight you looked this morning did have the office talking. But you have balls and courage, and I like that a lot. Looking back all these years later, I know that I saw two Sasquatch who both helped me to get an interview on time, even if I did look a little worse for wear. I truly believe they were alerted by my frantic screams and came to my rescue, all because I had an irrational terror of being late. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Kingston and I'm the quintessential Ohioan from the Buckeye State of Ohio, where I have lived my entire life and would never ever consider living anywhere else in the entire world, as I'm proud of my state and love living here. Ohio is on the northeastern edge of the Midwest section of the United States, with the Appalachian region covering the eastern part of the state, making up its largest territory, which is incredibly picturesque and rugged, with high hills and plunging valleys. Then there is the smaller bluegrass area to the south, consisting of steep cliffs, deep valleys, sinkholes and ubiquitous natural caves. Finally, the western part of the state is part of the flatter lowlands. I was born in Asheville, but from the age of ten years old, I was raised on a corn farm on the northeastern quadrant of the state. My father inherited this farm from my grandfather after he chose to move to a small little townhouse in Asheville, shortly after my grandmother died of breast cancer in 2003. I ascertained that my grandfather perceived that running the farm became too arduous and labour-intensive for him. It would seem that after my grandmother's untimely demise, he simply didn't have the heart to work the farm any more and reluctantly decided to retire. My dad was raised on this farm with his two sisters, who are now happily married and both living in Asheville with their respective other halves, so he knew the ins and outs of managing a farm. As you can imagine, my father was only too delighted to press on with running this family farm, which my grandfather did not want to sell, as he'd put his heart and soul and invested and expended his life's work, including his blood, sweat and tears in the place. 
It was totally understandable and unambiguous of him not to want to sell this beloved beguiling and bewitching place that held a lifetime of precious ineffaceable memories for him. My father knew that the farm was a good income earner, as the corn crop was indeed sizable, and so it was in 2003 my family, which consisted of me and both my younger sisters, Hattie and Jennifer, moved from our mundane, rather mediocre city lives in Asheville to the stunning red-bricked farmhouse with the large white sash windows and the stylish front door that had previously belonged to both of my grandparents. I assure you it would not have looked out of place in the English countryside. It had that quintessential old-world whimsical charm about it and an abundance of character so typically found in historic homes. It's almost as if bygone generations that had come and gone had left behind their indelible mark or blueprint on the place and even though they had long since passed on, I believe an essence of them still remains. On one occasion my grandfather actually told me that he had woken up during the night in the autumn of 1973 to see a young 1800s girl running across the verdant lawn and just vanishing before his very eyes. So there is without a doubt an energy to our home that is incredibly tangible. Of course no one ever got to see the little girl again, but we do believe she lived in the house once and died of pneumonia in the 1800s, according to the historic records. I think I must have been about ten when we moved into this exquisite home, which was in such pristine condition it didn't require any remodelling, thanks to my grandmother, who kept things in immaculate pristine condition and ensured that the house was always kept updated. The house possessed a gorgeous wraparound wooden deck that overlooked an exquisite silvery pond and was surrounded by undulating verdant valleys, ubiquitous clusters of trees, natural sylvan, acres of farmland and pretty prairies filled with wild flowers. As kids we were over the moon to move to the countryside and we were enraptured and enthused by the incredible space where we could go exploring, hiking, camping, fishing and mountain biking as often as we liked. As far as my father was concerned, leaving his job in the city to running the farm was a seamless transition. He was an accomplished farmer himself and highly proficient in everything about managing a corn crop. Better still, my mother didn't need any persuading in regards to this spontaneous, rather random move to the countryside, because she'd been raised on a farm herself as a young girl, and was eager to leave behind the life of a busy, bustling town. My strange, incredulous story begins when my grandfather came to stay with us one weekend in the summer of 2008. I remember he was walking onto the wooden wraparound porch with a gin and tonic in his hands, and he wanted to relax and enjoy the breathtaking tangerine orange sunset that saturated the valley in a vibrant golden haze. He had always enjoyed watching the magnificent sunset with my grandmother in their younger days, and this moment was incredibly nostalgic for him. My grandfather was blindly oblivious to the fact that there were pools of water on the deck, as our golden retriever Juniper had recently, unbeknown to all of us, taken a leisurely dip into the pond and was lying on the wooden deck to dry off. Juniper has always successfully brought the whole pond with him in that shaggy long coat of his, as pools of water literally enveloped the entire patio. As a result, my grandfather slipped on one of those puddles and lost his balance, breaking his femur quite severely. Naturally, he was rushed to hospital and underwent a lengthy surgery, and my parents insisted he recuperated back at the farmhouse, where they could take care of him while he recovered. My parents felt guilty about the accident and somewhat responsible for what had happened to my grandfather. Needless to say, Juniper received a big telling off and was relegated to the dog box for a couple of days, which meant he wasn't allowed to swim in the pond for a while. But believe me, that did not last long, because a day or so later he was chasing frogs and swimming in that pond all over again, oblivious to the chaos he had recently caused. We ended up putting a sign on the wooden deck saying, Danger! Wet dog! Slippery surface! I think my sisters and I really appreciated and enjoyed having our grandfather around at home, as he was always a good companion for all of us, watching television, playing cards with us, or telling us incredible stories about his life when he was a young boy. At this time of my life I was about 15 years old, and had become passionate about the subject of Bigfoot, and would tune in to all the programmes that I could find about the subject on television. My sisters thought my fascination with the critter was stupid and ridiculed me relentlessly for my keen interest in him. 
They emphatically believed that Bigfoot was as fetitious as the Tooth Fairy, and I was eager to prove them wrong. I would spend copious amounts of time in the wood green on our land, looking for any sign of Bigfoot activity, but it was to no avail, and I was very disappointed. I never found any footprints or any other signs that would point to a Bigfoot being present on our land, which did of course discourage me to a degree, but I was still an ardent, very firm believer in the subject. One day I introduced my grandfather to a Bigfoot programme on television, and I was surprised that he appeared rather interested and I asked him in a nonchalant way, Pops, do you think Bigfoot is real? Pops went quiet for a moment, looked really rather hesitant, as if he was wrestling as to whether he should let me in on a secret or not. He fiddled with his moustache awkwardly and said, Of course they're real, son. I don't doubt that for a moment. I sensed my grandfather knew more than he was saying, and my heart began to flutter with excitement. I knew I had to tread very carefully, as my grandfather had the ability to clam up tightly rather like a muscle in a shell. I thought quickly on my feet. How could I get him to spill his secret? I knew it would require some artful manipulation and guileful techniques on my part, as my grandfather was not a big talker at the very best of times, and getting him to spill his beans was pretty much like extracting blood from a stone. Nope, I said, cunningly. They're not real, Pops. All this stuff is just made-up nonsense. Everybody knows that. It's not made up, said my grandfather, getting his feathers all ruffled up, in a rather defensive mood. These critters are real. I've seen them myself. You're making that up, Pops, I teased. My grandfather grew indignant, and I knew my technique had worked famously. My grandfather piped, I'm telling you, son. We had trouble with these things on our farm before your father was born. And this was the story he revealed to me in his own words. I thought he was going to say that he'd seen a critter crossing his path one day while out in a cornfield or something. You know, the brief random sighting that most people tend to report. I was not prepared for the incredible story he was about to share with me, which was beyond anything I could have ever anticipated dreamed of or even foreseen. Without a shadow of a doubt, it knocked my socks off, as I hope it does yours. I want to assure you, my grandfather is the most down-to-earth person in the entire world, and is not inclined to make up fictitious stories, so I know what he has told me is the truth. This is his story. It all began in 1951, said my grandfather. I remember the day as if it was yesterday. I had an extensive vegetable bed at the time, that I was exceedingly proud of in the backyard, which I tended to daily. I grew tomatoes, zucchini, bell peppers, cauliflower, cabbage, parsnips, cucumbers, strawberries there. You name it, and I probably grew it. I'd also been growing some phenomenal, very sizable, sweet, delicious, juicy watermelons, and they were my pride and joy. Some of them were like monstrous giants. They were that big. I began to notice that a handful of them had mysteriously disappeared and I don't mind telling you that I was perturbed by this enigmatic matter, because I didn't know how an excessive watermelon could go walk about like this, unless someone was deliberately pilferaging them. I don't mind telling you that I was protective over my crop, and disappointed in the strange disappearance of these sizable natural treasures. It was on a Sunday morning, and an exquisitely warm summer's day. Your grandmother was in the kitchen making her scrumptious apple pie, and the whole kitchen smelt of cinnamon and apples. I was looking so forward to a piece of her delicious pie, so to kill time I just meandered casually into the back yard to look over my vegetable garden, rather like a proud parent watching its babies grow. That was when I saw what I can only describe as a massive critter squatting down on its powerful legs in my vegetable patch, where I grow my treasured watermelons. I noticed its colossal, powerful, muscular back was turned away from me. I remember thinking, what the heck? I couldn't fathom what I was observing, and my first thought was it had to be a bear. I mean, what else could it possibly be? It was covered in very long, flowing hair, but it wasn't the colour of a black bear. It was more like a mixture of colours, like blacks, blondes, reds and browns. It was an unusual, attractive colour, not normally seen or found in bears. I still thought it had to be a bear as I am used to oddities in nature, 
having been a farmer, of course. I could hear the critter was gobbling or crunching, and I knew he was tucking into my watermelon, and I was fuming. I raced back into the house, grabbing my rifle and firing some random shots at the critter. The critter got up, standing on his two feet, and I nearly fainted in shock. I could not believe what I was discerning. The critter was no bear. But what was it? It looked like a mixture of a man and an ape, and it was about seven foot tall, five hundred pounds, and three feet wide across the shoulders. I remember it was eating the watermelon much like an apple, and looked over at me in bewildered surprise after I'd fired some shots at him. And then it just took off like grease lightning with such grace. I've never seen anything move that fast in my entire life. This critter moved like the wind, with the watermelon still clasped in his hand, and he glanced back fleetingly to my direction, and then disappeared into the wood grove. Are you sure it was a Bigfoot? Well, at the time I had no idea what the critter was, but I assure you now I know it was a Bigfoot. No question about it in my mind. It had the cone-shaped head, overlong arms. And powerful, lofty body. As you can imagine, I informed your grandmother about what I had beheld eating watermelon in our vegetable patch. She wasn't best pleased with me shooting after the critter, as your grandmother just loved animals. I think she thought I had chased away a bear because it was difficult for her to comprehend that I had encountered a hairy man that looked rather like an ape. What did you do that for? She complained. Why did you not let the critter enjoy the watermelon? For goodness' sake. Why do you have to be so possessive over that wretched vegetable patch of yours? We won't be able to eat all those watermelons ourselves. So why are you being so cantankerous, grouchy, and difficult? Your grandmother let out an exasperated sigh and said, "I just don't understand you at times. It's hardly a wonder my hair's turned grey." It turned out your grandmother was absolutely right, as she invariably always was. It was the worst thing I could have done shooting after that Bigfoot. Because it came back to bite me hard in more ways than I could ever imagine. What do you mean? I asked, looking surprised. Well, that very night at the witching hour, when everything became hauntingly still, and there were no sounds of crickets or frogs, nor the occasional hoot of an owl or a howling coyote, all hell broke loose, much like the sound of thunder vibrating through a calm sky. At first, it began with these very loud, raucous, high-pitched screams that reverberated from every part of the valley, from the north, the east, the south, and the west, and they sounded like multiple women being murdered all at once. Your poor grandmother was so startled and terrified out of her skin, and began to sob. The noise was so ear-piercingly loud that it just went right through you. I remember that it was so creepy that it sent spooky, insidious chills down my spine. And caused the hair on my neck to stand on edge. We could hear thundering feet that sounded like a herd of trampeding elephants racing around our home over and over again in circles to intimidate and scare us. The next thing I knew was that large rocks were being flung at the house, and one or two of them went right through the window, shattering the glass pane, leaving shards of spiky glass everywhere. It felt like we were under siege. Your poor grandmother was in a dreadful state and began to scream. I truly did not know what on earth to do. I went to the top floor of our home and looked down and realized that there were three of these critters. You would have thought, judging by the raging, thunderous commotion they were making, that there were hundreds of these ruddy things, but there was only three of them. I could tell the critters were incredibly angry and incensed. They were lashing out with the stones, and so I reached for a high-caliber rifle and shot one of the critters dead. I remember it fell back to the ground and died instantly. The other two screamed out in absolute horror. One went running towards the dead critter and was shaking his fists, angry at me towards the upstairs window. I could tell she was a female. I ended up shooting her as well, and then the other one dead. I figured it was the three of them or the two of us, because I knew that those things would take me out now that I'd killed one of their family members. They did not look like they would forgive very easily. The next thing I knew was that your grandmother was sobbing inconsolably and was beating me with her fists all over my body and screaming, "Murderer! Murderer! Murderer! How could you kill them? You're a murderer! This is all your fault." I remember your grandmother wept and wept because she said the critters were so human. 
She told me if I hadn't shot after the critter with the watermelon, none of this would have happened in the first place, and she kept telling me she hated me for being such an insensitive person. What did you do with the bodies, I asked. Well, I buried them in the backyard, and let me tell you the size of these things were absolutely unbelievable. I had to get your grandmother to help me drag them along the grass to the grave, and she was far from willing to help me, but in the end she reluctantly agreed. They weighed an absolute ton. Your grandmother went to town and brought the most extravagant bouquets of exquisite flowers for their graves. Normally I would have protested about the lavish expense, but the look on your grandmother's face scared the living daylights out of me. It was like, if you dare mess with me, you're dead kind of look on her face. I've never seen your grandmother more enraged. She was so incensed with me. She made me feel like I was a murderer, like Ted Bundy or someone like that. The look she gave me, whew, they even haunt me today. Well, she insisted on us performing a lavish ceremony with church music and prayers for the creatures, which I thought was way over the top. But with your grandmother in the mood that she was in, I would have walked on hot coals to appease her. Wow, what a story, I said. It doesn't end there, son. There is more to this outlandish tale of mine. Hold on tight, because it gets more incredulous every single minute. There's more, I gasped. Oh, yes, there's more. You better believe it. There's more. The following morning I woke up to find my wife in the kitchen, feeding a two-foot-tall Bigfoot. Now that's going too far, I said. You expect me to believe that, Pops? Believe what you want, son. That's what I saw. Go on, I said. What happened? Well, your grandmother began waving her finger at me and said that if I hurt this little thing that she had found on the doorstep, we would be heading for the divorce courts any time soon. I knew by the look in her eyes that she meant business. Where did the little Bigfoot come from? I asked in amazement. Well, son, I hate to say this, but I think I might have caused it to become an orphan, as I'd taken out its entire family, and that included its mother. I think it came to our doorstep looking for help, as it was desperate and quite hungry. It was also bright and intelligent. I mean, the thing was helpless. It suddenly made me feel extraordinarily guilty, as this poor thing was lost and alone in the world. What was it like? Well, it was the sweetest thing ever, but very weary of me. It didn't trust me as far as you could throw me, but it loved your grandmother. I've never seen your grandmother happier than she was, looking after that little thing. It would make these cute little noises and it was a natural comic. It always made you laugh. Your grandmother brought it wooden blocks to play with, and it would sit on the floor for hours building things. It was incredibly creative. Your grandmother brought paints and crayons, and they would scribble together on large white pieces of art paper. I remember he loved smothering his hands in blue paint, and painting even the walls with his handprints, and even on your grandmother's dress. We had recently painted the kitchen wall, but I knew better than to say anything to your grandmother for fear of having my head bitten off by her. What kind of things did he eat, I asked curiously. Well, the creature had its preferences. He seemed to like oatmeal with honey and blueberries for breakfast. For lunch he'd happily eat brown bread sandwiches with peanut butter and jelly. And for dinner he enjoyed eating a steak, but usually raw, with baked potato and salad. He loved fresh fruit for pudding, especially grapes. He really loved grapes. Did he smell funny, I asked. They always say that Bigfoot stink. What a strange thing to ask, said my grandfather, looking indignant. He smelt just fine, let me tell you. How long did he stay with you? I wish I could say that he stayed long, but he was only with us for about four or five days. He never slept in the bed that your grandmother prepared for him. He would insist on lying in the dog bed, cuddling up to our red setter, who seemed to enjoy the companionship. I think the little critter had probably cuddled up to his mother this way. It was really cute to see the dog and the Bigfoot cuddled up together. He always lay in a fetal position, with his overlong arms around the setter's middle. I think after that critter left, poor little Lacey, who was the red setter, missed him a great deal. Makes sense, I said. How did he leave your home in the end? Well, it must have been on the fourth or fifth day in the evening, when there was a loud slapping at the kitchen door. Your grandmother opened it and standing there was a female Bigfoot. Your grandmother was absolutely amazed. The female critter seemed reticent and terribly shy, 
almost as if it had taken all her nerve and steely courage to actually approach the door. But amazingly, she held her ground, and even looked in your grandmother's eyes, with a deep-set pair of brown eyes. Your gran said her eyes seemed very kind. We never got the impression that this was little Bigfoot's mother, but possibly a distant family member. She was much more red in colour than the Bigfoot's I'd shot, whose coats were multi-coloured, with reds, browns and blondes. Your grandmother knew what she wanted, and so she took the little Bigfoot and handed it over to the female, and watched it climb on her back like a tree into a piggyback style, and they just glided away together. I did get the sense that the critter knew the female, because it was so happy to see her again, and recognised her at once. How did the female know you had the little Bigfoot? That's what I want to know, I asked. Well, maybe she'd seen your grandmother playing with the little one in the yard, helping her plant seedlings or something, because those things they seem to know things, and sense things that we don't. How did Granny react when the little Bigfoot left? I imagine she must have been so heartbroken to lose the little critter. Well, she did have mixed emotions on the matter. On one hand, she was so happy that the Bigfoot was back with a family member in his natural environment. But on the other hand, she had grown exceedingly attached to the little fellow. I mean, she'd even named the thing. What did she call it, I asked. She called him Sundance, and sometimes shorted his name to Sunny. She told me the name was inspired when the critter was in the sun. He almost seemed to perform a little dance because he enjoyed being outside with your granny. Did you ever see Sundance again? I asked. No, son, I didn't, and your grandmother blamed me for that. She said that no sensible, self-respecting Bigfoot family would ever be crazy enough to lay down any roots with me around because I couldn't be trusted. Oh dear, I said, Granny wasn't easy on you. Well, it would seem I redeemed myself when your father was finally born, as your grandmother was head over heels in love with all her children, and so all her maternal attention was lavished on them. But I know she never quite forgave me for killing those Bigfoots. Looking back, I did possibly overreact, but they gave us such a big scare throwing stones at our house like that. I did what I thought needed to be done at the time, right or wrong. I think you were just trying to protect Granny Pops, I said. You were doing the best you could at the time. Thank you, son. I appreciate that. As you can imagine, after my fa- grandfather's incredible story, I did go and search the Sylvan on our land on multiple occasions, but never saw any signs of Bigfoot activity, although he is hoping that one day I will indeed catch a glimpse of the critter. I have a friend who lives on a neighbouring farm who had a Bigfoot sighting recently and I must say I am so envious of him. He told me he'd woken up to a strange snorting sound in the back yard. It sounded rather like a horse breathing. He said that his two dogs that slept in the house were barking non-stop, and he saw the dark shadowy figure of a Bigfoot through the kitchen window that held his gaze for a moment with that red eye shine, and then disappeared like grease lightning. I sometimes wonder, did he see Sundance? I hope he did and I often wonder if he's still around. I do hope so. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Roy and my brother's name is Keith, and we're both from Florida, which is situated on a peninsula between the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean and the Florida Straits, spanning over two time zones. We are from the Carroll Woods area in Tampa, Florida, where we were born and raised. We are both twins with very different personalities. Keith, who is the older twin, has always been the wise head on young shoulders, pragmatic, practical and circumspect. At the time of this seemingly incredulous outlandish story, he possessed the quintessential powerful body of a prime, very strong athlete that many admired and envied. I've always been much less athletic than he was, but also carefree, impulsive, industrious and headstrong by nature, compared to my responsible brother. My story begins in the early spring of 1982, when my brother and I were 25 years old at the time. This was when we both decided to take a -a once-in-a-lifetime rafting trip. Our plan was to explore the remote, exquisite, uncharted badlands of the gates of the Arctic National Park in Alaska, which consisted of 8.4 million acres of unexplored remote Alaskan wilderness. 
There are no roads or trails in sight, so we would be able to enjoy hiking, camping and kayaking under the midnight sun, trekking through tundra, gorges, steep uneven terrain and thick vegetation. We would be able to go rafting along resplendent, untouched waterways, and we both knew that this journey would leave an indelible impression on our lives, and we were certainly not wrong about that. For indeed, unbeknown to us, this would be an outlandish experience that would literally change our view of the natural world in ways we would never envisage or comprehend. This would be a voyage of a lifetime, and two months prior to our trip, we prepped ourselves physically for this gruelling, daunting expedition. As we both knew, there would be times that we might be sitting and paddling in swift water currents where we would and might potentially even need to swim. I managed to attain a level of fitness that exceeded my highest expectations and even managed to impress my brother. Fast forward to two months, where my extraordinary story begins. And so there we were, at last, embarking upon our dream, an adventure of a lifetime in an Alaskan bush plane, about to be dropped off in the secluded, isolated area of remote, uninhabited wilderness, far from any civilization. Our bush pilot was a congenial, friendly young man called Rob, and he commented freely that we were his first rafters he was dropping off of the season, which should have set off the alarm bells ringing in our heads more than it actually did. It's hard to believe that spring is already upon us, he told me, in a bright, chirpy, warm voice. It's been an oppressive, insufferable, bitterly cold winter, and spring in Alaska is a breathtaking relief. So beautiful, especially those open prairies with their spring flowers. Mind you be careful out there, because I'm not sure all the ice has melted yet, although it should have done. Are we really the first rafters that you've dropped off this season, asked my brother, looking rather concerned. Should we have held our trip back for a while, he asked the pilot, looking ever so slightly alarmed. Look, it's not for me to pass comment, said the bush pilot. I've lived in Alaska my entire life. I could tell you some harrowing stories about the natural world and the unexpected surprises she can fling upon us from time to time. Nothing is ever without risk, whatever way you look at it. You just need to be judiciously careful and vigilant out there, because accidents can happen when we least expect them to. This is grizzly country, with plenty of black bears and roaming packs of wolves. You do have one distinct advantage, he chuckled. You'll pretty much have all that river to yourself, because I think my next drop-off to these parts is in two days' time. So you're early birds, as the rafting season starts in a week's time. The early bird catches the worm, I said proudly. It'll be great to have the river to ourselves. I can't wait. My brother was twitching nervously in the plane, with an apprehensive look on his sullen face. I could tell that the news about us being the first arrivals had discomposed him somewhat. "'What's wrong, Keith?' I asked him. "'You look so troubled and uptight. "'Don't you think there may be a good reason "'why people leave the kayaking a week later?' he asked. "'Possibly not all the snow has melted yet.' "'Oh, don't be ridiculous, Keith,' I told him. "'It's just like Rob said. "'We just need to be shrewd and astute. "'That's all. "'Do you always drop your passengers off at the same spot?' "'My brother asked the pilot gingerly. Always, said Rob, landing the bush plane on the side of the lake and helping us out with all our luggage. Have a good trip, he said. Enjoy yourself. That's the main thing. Before long, we'd packed our raft with all our supplies and began rafting down the Koyukuk River in a southerly direction, carefully following the coordinates of our map, knowing full well that we were six days away from the nearest town. We were bedazzled and beguiled by the scenic, picturesque, panoramic displays of sculptural, imposing, craggy outcrops, statuesque mountains and towering quaken aspen, cottonwood and spruce trees. We had many spectacular sightings of bald eagles hovering above us in the sky with masterful outstretched wings that I watched in awe through my binoculars. It was so tranquil, peaceful and quiet along the river and with the cool breeze blowing against my face, I was feeling incredibly excited about this challenging, testing, yet inspirational undertaking. I could see that poor Keith was becoming beleaguered and aggrieved when we began to observe that there were still ice banks on the river's edge, which should have all melted by now. 
The sight of these unmelted snowdrifts was worrisome and problematic for him. I'm not happy, he confided. These ice banks should have thawed by now, and the calm water is becoming friskier and is getting significantly speedier. I'm wondering if we should head back. I think we've been premature with all our arrangements, and I'm not feeling good about this unmelted snow. Something is distinctly off about all of this. We're in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, and we can't go taking unnecessary risks. Are you kidding, I piped. Are you going to let a few little ice banks spoil our trip? The season starts in a week's time. The snow banks can't be that bad, surely. It's not about that, said Keith. You heard what Rob said back there in the plain. It was a bad winter this year, so nature could be behind schedule, and the thawing may be slower than it should be. It's better to be safe rather than sorry. I was unable to pass any comment, because all of a sudden all hell broke loose in a matter of seconds. That was how fast and unexpected the turn of events were, as is the case in most disasters. The choppy, powerful current of the river gathered momentum, escalating in its speed and seizing control of our raft, sweeping us down the river like a fragile, delicate paper boat. We tried our best to fight back, with all our strength and might, but our physical manoeuvres were as feeble and fruitless as battered leaves floating on the surface of the water, for we were no match against this boisterous, tempestuous, turbulent current that had a fickle, capricious and volatile mind all of its own. All of a sudden, with an almighty, thunderous crash, our raft was capsized. It smashed violently into a vast ice bank that covered the water like the tight-fitting plastic cover of a Tupperware container. We were forcefully flung and thrown under the annihilating, destructive current with a vicious swirling and powerful tugging motion. We were pulled and trapped under this ocean of freezing cold ice, seemingly disabled and powerless to rise to the surface to draw any breath. I wrestled with the water like a fighter in a boxing ring, and for a moment my life flashed fleetingly before my eyes in a series of hazy pictures. I realised with horrifying revelation and repose that this was indeed the day of my death. I had always assumed that I was invincible and that bad things happened to other people and not to me. I had never ever envisaged my life ending like this, but with my arduous struggle against the reckless current, I surrendered to the hopelessness of my plight, realising that I literally was done. I could feel my brother pulling my clothes tenaciously under the ice, dragging me through the water, thrusting my head up into an air pocket under the ice, where we both drew restorative, life-giving breaths. The water was so choppy and the current so powerful that after I had only drawn a couple of breaths, I was once again seized and sucked under the water like a vacuum. This is all I actually remembered as the next thing I knew, I was shivering and shaking and my head was literally thumping and I could taste the salty blood in my mouth, which I ascertained was coming from an open gash from a wound in my head. You saved my life, I said, looking up at my brother in awe, as if he was my hero. What on earth happened? I can't remember anything. I feel so dizzy, confused and disorientated, I told him. Luckily the ice shelf wasn't too big, said my brother. You knocked your head very hard under it. Don't you remember a thing? I shook my head vigorously. I do remember vaguely you shouting at me and telling me to swim to shore, but then it all goes blank after that. Well, after you got to shore, you definitely passed out, my brother informed me. I think you might have sustained a slight concussion from that wound on your head. I also had to squeeze the water out of your lungs. For a moment, I thought you were a goner. You gave me quite a scare. Another thing is certain. You can't walk on that leg of yours, because your ankle is in a very bad way, it's most certainly broken. I glanced down at my body briefly, somewhat shocked at my appalling state. I was freezing cold, lying there in my boxes and vest, shivering, quivering and shaking. I've never known cold like that before. My body was literally purple and blue. My brother had removed my sopping clothes, and my ankle looked very swollen, odd and misshapen. I knew it must be badly broken. I couldn't move much, so the danger of getting hypothermia increased for me with every passing second. My brother, cautiously aware of this sobering reality, had wrapped his entire body around me for warmth, and despite his very best efforts, I continued to quiver with the cold. Worse still, after the adrenaline surge had subsided, the shooting, throbbing pain in my body became excruciating, 
and be I began to cry out in agony. I had never known pain like this before in my entire life. It hurts, Keith, I cried. My whole body hurts, and I feel so cold. I've never felt this cold before. It's hardly surprising, Roy. I think that water battered and thrashed the living life out of you like a washing machine on full throttle. It's hardly a wonder that you're feeling so fragile, as you really have sustained a hell of a beating. You aren't nearly as tough as I am, and that current had no mercy, let me tell you that. He continued, I've hung up your clothes to dry, but there is some bad news. We've lost everything from the raft, including the raft, of course. I watched in amazement as my proficient brother began to build a fire, gathering wood and kindling together, and he pulled out some waterproof matches that he carried in his jacket pocket at all times. I must confess I truly believe the fire saved my life, as I was able to warm up significantly, and my shivering subsided. My clothes thankfully dried, although it was an immense struggle to dress again. Of course I was in a frail state, so every muscle ached, my body throbbed with pain, and my broken ankle only exacerbated the problem. I'm so sorry, I confessed. This is all my fault. No, it's my fault, insisted Keith. Don't ever blame yourself. I knew the moment that the pilot told us that we were the first rafters this season that something wasn't right. I know that even in nature a few days can make a monumental amount of difference. I can see that people have clearly avoided rafting for a reason, but I didn't listen to my gut in the way that I should have. All the ice around the river is a big get-out sign, but I ignored it. We should have hiked instead of kayaked down the river and waited a few more days until the ice finally melted, and we would not be in this precarious, sticky situation that we've got ourselves into. I've let the both of us down, and I'm truly ashamed. Well, what are we going to do, I stammered. We are well and truly stranded. We're out on a limb, so to speak, because we cannot exactly call for help, can we? I have devised a plan, my brother told me. But you need to stay here. I will be retracing our steps along the river by following the bank, and I want to make it back to where the bush pilot originally dropped us off. He did inform us that he would be dropping passengers off there in two days' time. I remember the clearing very well, as I made a mental note of it, and so I'll hike back to that spot and wait for his bush plane to drop off his passengers, and then I can get help and collect you and take you to hospital. Sounds like a plan, I said. I'm worried about you being on your own at the mercy of the wild animals, he told me. I'll gather an excess of firewood for you, and you need to somehow crawl on your hands and knees to the wood stash I collect to keep the fire going at all times. Just keep throwing wood and kindling back into the fire. It's your only defence against wild animals. He handed me a large piece of timber for self-defence to use against a predator, if needed. You can also make as much noise as possible to scare them off and startle them away. You must make sure you stay awake during the night. I know it's hard, but if you fall asleep, you predispose yourself to unwarranted danger because anything can creep up on you when you're asleep. I don't want you to go, I said, tears spilling down my cheeks. I don't want to be left on my own. Everything hurts, and I'm afraid of grizzly bears and wolves. My brother took me into his arms. Roy, I have to get help. We haven't got choice in the matter. I'll be as fast as I possibly can, I promise you. Be strong and be brave. I have full faith in you. I know you can do it. And I'll pray to God for help. I'll ask him to send an angel to keep you safe while I'm gone. My brother and I embraced warmly, and I watched him sadly walking away, as he waved to me one last time. He was much tougher than me emotionally and physically, and even though he was my twin, he was much more powerfully built than I was. During our school years, he'd won awards for swimming and wrestling. It was hardly surprising he'd come out of this fiasco with only a few scratches to show for it. He had steely grit and determination, so I knew I was in great hands, but I was still fearful being left on my own to face the night with dangerous, perilous predators lurking around in this rugged, uncertain wilderness. I was seated in a craggy, precipitous clearing in close proximity to a backdrop of quaken aspen trees, overlooking the swift current of the treacherous river, where parts of the ice bank were now breaking apart, and I could hear their cracks. I sat back against the rocky boulder to support my upper torso, watching the flames of the crackling fire, overwhelmed with feelings of total and utter exhaustion. My head was pounding and throbbing, and the pain from being pummeled and battered so vigorously and aggressively by the current 
had completely drained and enervated me. I noted that my fatigued eyelids were getting heavier and droopier with every passing minute, and although I tried my level best to remain awake, before I knew it, I must have fallen fast asleep. I was awoken during the night in a slightly disorientated, delirious, confused, semi-conscious state. I felt cosy and warm, and found myself covered in a bear pelt, and I noticed that the fire was burning brightly, and more wood had been replaced on the crackling flames. I think because of the bump I had sustained on my head, I accepted all these strange, surreal, dream-like anomalies as almost commonplace, and continued to sleep unperturbed. I woke up with a sudden start, remembering where I was, and that I shouldn't have fallen asleep. I was supposed to stay awake at all times, but I had failed miserably to keep this promise, so I was thankful to still be alive, and angry with myself for failing in this endeavour. I realised to my amazement that the morning had already broken. I could hear the pretty bird song in the valley, and the sound of the swift hazardous current crashing violently against the ice and breaking it further apart. I discovered that I was still wrapped up in a bear pelt, and that the fire was crackling away merrily in the fire pit. All this had played out in my dream, but this was no dream. It was real. I was very bewildered and startled. I looked around me in confusion, having discerned that someone was clearly taking care of me. And imagine my surprise when I discovered that one of our backpacks that had been swept away in the vicious fearsome current was lying on the ground an arm's distance away from me. I crawled towards the backpack and unzipped it, pulling out a bottle of lemonade that I drank so gratefully. The sweetness was exactly what I needed, along with a granola bar that I ate hungrily. The sweet burst of sugar fired up my system with a satisfying contentment. Suddenly I realised someone was watching me, and then I saw her as she glided gracefully towards the fire. She was a wild woman covered in long flowing brown hair. I watched her in awe and stunned silence as she poked away at the fire, placing more wood on the open flames. The wild woman remained quiet, saying nothing to me, but looking at me closely with deep-set, treacle-coloured eyes. I was not afraid, although I should have been, but I could sense her kindness and genuine concern for my welfare. I realised that this mysterious-looking wild woman had indeed come to my aid during the night, just like an angel. She had placed a bear pelt over my body to keep me warm, and had kept the fire going all night. And more amazing than anything else, she had somehow managed to retrieve one of our rucksacks from the water. I marvelled at how she had come to my aid, so generously and selflessly. As she stoked up the fire, I studied her closely, for I had never seen a creature like her before in my entire life. I would say that there were ape-like aspects to her appearance, but the humanness to her was utterly remarkable. I noted she was very slender with small pert breasts, but solidly built with stocky muscular short legs and overlong arms, with very powerful shoulders that were easily over three feet in width. I would say she weighed about 500 pounds and was about seven foot tall. Her whole body, with the exception of her face, was covered in long dark brown hair with an auburn hue that was possibly the length of a long-haired retriever. I noticed also that she had a pyramid-shaped head that folded into her shoulders seamlessly, small ears and long hair that fell neatly down to her shoulders. Her face was very feminine, and her leathery skin was a greyish colour, with a wide flat nose, slender mouth and deep furrowed brow ridge. Yet even today I marvel at her humanness that was quite unfathomable. The wild woman pointed towards my waterproof backpack and began to pull out some of the items, and when I reached out with my hand... She immediately placed the item next to me, as she recognised that I wanted this, and I didn't want that. I pointed to the pot and also to the river, and she immediately understood my request, for she appeared intelligent and discerning, anticipating all my needs. She obediently went to fill the pot for me with water from the river, and I was able to make myself some coffee, thanks to all her help, as I found sachets of coffee and sugar in my backpack. I also found a bottle of pain pills among the items, and I was able to suppress some of the terrible pain that was a huge relief of note, let me tell you. I think the wild woman realised I was incapacitated and couldn't walk, and she went over and above the call of duty to assist me in every way conceivable, leaving me alone only for a while, but always returning to dutifully fill up my water pot 
and to keep the flames of my fire going. As the dusky night rolled over the valley, I heard the wild woman talking to a very large wild man in a strange language that was high-pitched, fast and very chatty, rather like Chinese in its tonal frequency. It sounded as if she was dishing him out a long stream of orders that she wished for him to obey. He towered over her and was possibly ten foot tall and Herculean in size and width. I really sensed he had a younger energy about him and was possibly her fully grown son, although I cannot be certain of this fact. If I was to encounter this intimidating hairy giant in the wilderness, I would run for my life because he looked fierce, imposing and dangerous, but I knew he was eager to do the female's bidding and looked upon her with great respect. He did give me a fleeting glance, and the once over with his deep-set, dark, treacle-coloured eyes, that also registered a kind concern for me. Never once did I sense any animosity or aggression from him, which was surprising, given the way he looked. Before long he was standing not far away from me, much like those soldiers outside Buckingham Palace, with their black busbies on their heads, not moving a single muscle, and standing very still. I sensed he was on guard duty and that she had asked him to watch over me during the night to protect me from any wild animals. I can assure you I doubt anything would have come close to him. The female kept attending to me during the night and even brought me a large fish which I cooked in my pot and ate and I have to admit it was delicious. I would like to point out that never once did I ever discern any unpleasant smells or body odours from these creatures who actually just smelt like the forest. They were not repugnant, as described in many reports from witnesses. Fast forward to a day or so, although my sense of time was exceedingly warped and displaced, that was when the sound of a bush plane was heard roaring above me. I heard the female critter cry out with a jubilant whooping sound as she was so delighted that help had finally arrived for me. I could sense she was absolutely thrilled for me. I watched her gliding into the wood green on her short, powerful legs, but she did seem to nod at me, as if she was actually saying goodbye, and I returned the favour. I never saw her again, although I did sense her watching us from between the quaking aspen trees. I called after her. Thank you, wild woman. Thank you. You saved my life. The bush plane landed and Keith climbed out of the plane eagerly. He came running towards me, and we embraced like two brothers who came so close to losing each other. We were over the moon to be reunited again. I could feel the emotions bubbling up inside me as I realised in that moment how much I loved and adored my brother and how grateful I was that we were both alive as things could have turned out so differently for the both of us. We held each other for a long while and sobbed and sobbed with relief and total joy. Thank God you're alive, he said. I was so worried about you. I kept praying to God that he would send you an angel to watch over you with that head injury of yours, I was absolutely terrified that you might pass out during the night. In truth, I wasn't altogether sure that I would find you alive. Keith's eyes suddenly glanced towards the fire, and my open backpack, and the pot of water. I don't understand, he said. Where on earth did you get the backpack from? It was submerged by the water and swept away by the powerful current, and in your state you could have never retrieved it from the lake on your own. "'Is someone here with you?' he asked, looking around the immediate vicinity. "'Well, your prayer was answered,' I told him. "'A hairy angel came to my rescue, but I do not know who or what she was. "'But I will fill you in on the details later,' I assured him. "'But let's get going in the meantime.' "'My brother carried me to the bush plane in his powerful arms, "'with the bush pilot insisting on helping, "'and I went to hospital where I received surgery for my broken ankle.' Even to this day he blames himself for the accident we incurred, although I know that if it were not for my impulsive, enthusiastic determination, we may have held back the kayaking for a few days and would never have experienced such a peculiar sequence of events where we became submerged by a table of ice that potentially almost cost us our lives. In truth, I never ever believed I would share my story with anyone because it is a deeply personal, intimate account for me that has impacted my life in a poignant, tangible way. For a long time I never knew what it was that I'd encountered that fateful day. Now I know the critters that came to my rescue were actually Bigfoots. I believe the female Bigfoot saved my life. I think my overwhelming fatigue and exhaustion and the concussion that I had got 
would ultimately have killed me and left me as an easy target for a hungry pack of wolves. The female Bigfoot came to my rescue and help. I will never know why, but she was like a guardian angel for me, as my brother's prayers were most certainly answered that day. And who says an angel has to fit the profile of being dressed in white with a pair of wings? I'm sure they come in all shapes and sizes. I am aware that there are others like my brother and myself who have incurred nasty accidents with ice banks on treacherous rivers out there in Alaska, with shocking stories not unsimilar to our own, with less than favourable results and consequences, I regret to say. My advice is that if you are visiting Alaska for a rafting excursion, make sure it's at the right season, and that all the ice banks have finally gone. If there are tourists around, it's a very good sign, and if you're a novice, it might be wiser to go on a guided tour, as never ever underestimate how treacherous and unmerciful the perils of nature can actually be. As my brother wisely always says, it is so much better to be safe than sorry. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Atsa, a Navajo name meaning eagle. That means strength, wisdom and courage. I'm from North Carolina, situated in the southeastern region of the United States, which lies on the Atlantic coast midway between New York and Florida, bounded by Virginia and the Atlantic Ocean to the east, and South Carolina and Georgia to the south, and Tennessee to the west. We are known for our quintessential, perfect beaches, which is a desired tourist destination for many people around the world, and the Great Smoky National Park, which is the most visited park in the entire United States. I was born and raised in North Carolina by my Navajo father and my New Yorker mother. My story that ultimately led to my Bigfoot encounter happened to me in the 80s, and for the sake of protecting the people in the story, I'd like to keep the location in my story anonymous, if you don't mind. At the time of my extraordinary encounter, I was 25 years old and was a qualified veterinary surgeon and an experienced tracker and hunter following in my father's footsteps and his father before him, who was Navajo, and knew everything about hunting and tracking, as the culture's ancient roots are deeply connected to the land. From a very young age, my father taught me absolutely everything he knew about the natural world, and it was an awe-inspiring skill he was desirous to pass on to me, as his legacy, so to speak. I have the extraordinary ability to go into a region and see things that other people will almost certainly overlook. I may notice something like a tuft of grass bent backwards in a particular way, or some peeled bark on a tree, or anything like that, which immediately gives me information about the animals that have recently frequented the area. It is a phenomenal, formidable skill that goes well beyond just tracing blood trails after a hunt to locate an injured deer, or even following animal scat or imprints in the ground. Another aspect of the job is extrasensory perception, this is an innate sense of intuition which I have developed over many years from my Navajo roots through meditation and connecting with my higher self. This is a prodigious skill we are all capable of developing and is something built within each and every one of us as a natural inbuilt protective mechanism. It is when information within our gut persuades us to leave a place or to abandon the hunt or not to go to work on a particular day or not to trust an individual you encounter. I gather during the 9-11 disaster there were people who didn't go to the World Trade Center on that fateful day. They sensed something was not right. Some may have called in sick on the day in question, as on an unconscious level they knew instinctively that something was wrong, and psychologically it manifested itself in them in the form of a physical sickness. On a subliminal level they were actually listening to their gut, and is something we all need to learn to do, as it serves our greatest interest and our highest good. When I visit a location, sometimes I will close my eyes and feel the energy of a place, and you will be amazed what I can discern. I have even found lost children with this finely honed sensory perception. Every morning I arise early to meditate, so that whatever the day may hold or involve, it gives me a heightened, finely tuned awareness and perception of how to deal with people, animals and situations I may encounter, for me it's as vital as grabbing that morning coffee for that quintessential caffeine boost. Even in the 80s when I was a young man, there was no coverage about Sasquatch or Bigfoot at the time, but I had learnt about the existence of the giant hairy men that lived in the caves within the mountains from my grandfather. 
He told me many stories about these people, who were described as reticent, shy, and in most cases benign and benevolent. There were, of course, some of these hairy men that were dangerous and aggressive, but this behaviour was more inclined to be found in the males, who were dominant and territorial. My grandfather told me of a case he remembered as a young boy. It concerned a little girl called Dolly, which in Navajo means bluebird, who went to play in the forest. He knew the girl well, for he had played with her on multiple occasions, as she was a year older than him. On this occasion, after playing hide-and-seek in the woods with her friends, none of the children could locate her hiding place, and she failed to return back to the village. The villagers were fearful that she had been attacked and devoured by a wild animal, but she was returned safe and well, carried in the powerful arms of a hairy giant from the mountains. My grandmother said that they were about to search for the young girl when they heard this booming sound. It sounded like something heavy was bolting and thundering through the forest, and that was when they saw him. My grandfather said that they knew that the legends were true, and a race of giants did indeed live within the mountains. My grandfather described the man as being big, covered in long golden brown hair, with overlong arms and powerful legs that moved with incredible grace, and he held his torso so straight like that of a soldier. He smelt strongly of the pine cones from the valley. The child's mother went running fearlessly towards the giant, for so grateful was she to see her daughter alive. The giant placed the girl gently on the ground and made a strange grunting sound. My grandfather said he had the kindest eyes that he has ever seen in his life, and that was the only thing he could remember about the face, were those lovely gentle eyes, so filled with genuine warmth and compassion. It is ironic that Dolly's name meant Bluebird in Navajo, which means good news, and her return to the safety of the village was good news indeed. The giant turned away and glided gracefully back into the woods. It would seem that the little girl had stumbled and fallen, spraining her ankle, and she said the big man with the fuzzy hair had rescued her and told her in her mind that all would be well and not to be afraid. My personal story that led me to my own encounter with the hairy man happened in the summer of 1984, when I received a very alarmed phone call from a man whose family had lost their pet tiger, called Tiger Lily. They didn't want to get into trouble with the authorities and needed me to track her down, and so they called upon my ultimate discretion in regards to this matter. I arrived at the home to a family that was quite literally broken-hearted to have lost their pet tiger. I will not pass judgment on the family's choice to keep a pet tiger, but in my opinion it is not a wise decision to make, because these animals are still wild and could potentially be dangerous. Tigers are natural predators and should be regarded as such. I was to learn that the tiger was placed in its enclosure after the animal had been lying in the living room with the family, watching television. I gather this was a regular event, and the tiger was treated like a domestic cat or dog, as it possessed a docile, gentle temperament. My cat nuzzles up to her all the time, I was told. She's a gentle soul, and has never ever once even lashed out. I don't even think she would know how to kill something, she told me, as her food is always given to her in a raw state. I went to put her in her enclosure last night, said the owner, a very congenial woman called Lizzie, and I heard the phone ring and went to answer it, closing the door behind me without locking it. I was so distracted, and my naughty eight-year-old girl went and let the tiger out, and I only learnt about it this morning when I came to check on her. I think she's been gone for at least twelve hours now. We did go looking for her, but we couldn't find her anywhere. I know she must be in the Sylvan. What is your tiger's name? I asked. Her name is Tiger Lily, said Lizzie. She's a very gentle, docile cat. Please don't be intimidated by her, because she's not at all aggressive. If you call her, she does respond to her name. Look, ma'am, I said, not to put too fine a point on it, but a wild animal is wild, domesticated or not. I need to warn you that in the worst-case scenario, I might need to kill her. I do hope that does not happen, but I need to warn you about the distinct possibility that it could. I will be able to read her temperament and energy before I make any decisions in regard to this matter, and it will be my last option. What is more pressing is to retrieve this animal, dead or alive, in order to protect other people who could end up in the firing line of this predator because at this moment she is a very present danger 
not only to herself but to others, and that is my gravest concern. Please don't speak about Tiger Lily like that, said Lizzie. I know what you people think of us keeping wild animals as pets, but I absolutely promise you she's just a big pussy cat with the hugest heart. If she was a danger, I would have never kept her for so long. I've got young children, you know. As far as I'm concerned, she's a very significant part of our family, she said, handing me Tiger Lily's collar and lead. If you put this on her, she'll follow you out of the woods. I'm convinced she's in the wood green, but the trouble is the place stretches back for many miles, so she could be absolutely anywhere in there, which is why we need you to find her. And so it was I entered the vast wooded area that stretched back for many long miles, and I began to examine the verdant environment, and sure enough I encountered my first tiger tracks. But as I proceeded forwards, I felt the vibrations and knew instinctively she was not around the immediate vicinity, as the sweep was filled with pretty chirps and warbles from the birds. I did not sense her presence. The wood green was exquisitely magnificent, a perfect umbrageous shaded oasis for many woodland animals, with statuesque trees rising up into the sky with such poise and masterful grace. The gentle alluring light of the sun bespeckled the forest floor in pretty soft ethereal light, which brought on a magical ambience to this enchanting sanctuary. It was draped in delicate gauzy ferns and pretty evergreen ground covers, and lavish moss draped the shapely branches of trees in a resplendent green velvet. I noted areas of the undergrowth that had been recently pressed down by pools that were sizable enough to be a tiger's, and so I knew I was on the right track. I followed the faint markings in a north-easterly direction, and as I walked through this quarter, I observed a dozen looking deer who were very skittish and ill at ease, and it was completely clear to me by their tense, twitchy body and dispositions that they had recently fled from a predator. Their energy was so on edge. I knew things were looking promising, and something had really scared them. I imagined it was likely to have been the presence of Tiger Lily. I followed their trail of fresh deer scat that led forwards in a northerly direction. I closed my eyes and listened. Eventually the forest became incredibly quiet and alarmingly still. There was no sign of any bird song, and I could sense and feel a powerful presence in my mist. I knew I'd hit pay dirt, as I could feel that tiger and sense her formidable energy. I moved stealthily forwards through the brush, taking care about being as noiseless as possible and hiding behind one tree trunk and then another and another. That was when I saw her, and my heart stopped beating for a moment. I want to assure you that despite working with wild animals regularly, there is something about a predator, even one owned as a pet, that has a remarkably disturbing effect on one's countenance. I immediately drew upon all my inner strength, closing my eyes for a moment and centering myself. The tiger was lying under a tree, submerged by some brush, and lying next to her was a little fawn that she was licking tenderly with her large pink tongue, as if it was her own youngling. I have heard of this behaviour in the wild before, where females with maternal leanings adopt animals from outside their species. I perceived that Tiger Lily was comforted by the presence of this little fawn. I closed my eyes to feel her energy, and I immediately was overwhelmed with emotions of fear and anxiety. Many believe that an animal as powerful and remarkable as a tiger would never feel fear, but this wild cat most certainly did, and I knew that she was disorientated, confused and uncertain by her environment. It was hard to fathom why she had failed to find her way back home, but a tiger's sense of smell is not as acute as their other senses. I moved slowly through the undergrowth and called out the tiger's name. Tiger Lily, I called. Tiger Lily. But I did this in a very gentle, non-threatening voice, which is very, very important. The tiger looked up and immediately darted over to my side, in such a congenial way, and she was jubilantly happy to see me. She began to make a chuffy sound, which is the equivalent of a cat's purr, a sound I am well acquainted with as indeed the only wild animals capable of purring, is in fact the cheetah. I could feel the energy of her joy to see a human face, and the sense of reassurance and security that my presence instilled in her, and I knew she would easily follow my lead without much prodding. While the fawn followed behind her, as this little fawn had now adopted the tiger, 
as her new mother. I even reached out and stroked Tiger Lily's striped coat, and my gentle touch offered reassurance to her. It was clear that this was a tiger oblivious of her own strength and power, who clearly believed she was a pussycat. I would say that I have never yet encountered a tiger quite as gentle and docile as Tiger Lily, and returning her to her owners was one of the easiest rescue missions I have ever, ever undergone. It really was that easy. As you can imagine, the owners were over the moon to be reunited with Tiger Lily, and even the dogs welcomed her back with rapturous barks of delight. The family were beside themselves in tears. No one looked more relieved to be back home than Tiger Lily herself, and she was rubbing her body against everybody, like a domestic pussycat marking her territory. My next job was to see what I could do about the little fawn. Granted, I could take it back to the local sanctuary where it would be raised by human volunteers, but that was not the best option. As a tracker, I knew that if I followed the deer scat, I might be able to reunite the mother with her fawn, and that was a preferable option for me. I was certain that the skittish deer that I had seen earlier on would still be in the vicinity where I had last seen them, as they were taking coverage in some thick brush. I wiped the fawn down, trying to remove any scent from her, as the scent of a human can attract predators. I gently lifted her in a blanket and proceeded upon my way. If I was to find the mother, it needed to be done quickly as possible, as the fawn needed feeding. I trekked through the sylvan, retreating down the path I had formerly ventured down in the northeasterly direction. And there they were, the deer that I had seen earlier on. I immediately put the little fawn down and called out with the sound of a fawn in distress, as this little fawn was not making any distress calls herself. My father taught me how to make these calls when I was a young boy, and it enables a female doe to start investigating. Within seconds a doe came ambling towards the fawn, while I kept myself well hidden in the brush. I knew at once this was the mother, and she seemed delighted to be united with her youngling. The doe bleated joyfully, a sound that they often make when they're happy, and she swished her tail from side to side, which is a sign of relaxation. My mission accomplished, I began to walk away, feeling really delighted about having righted the wrongs of the day, and it wasn't long before I began to sense that I was being watched. I immediately closed my eyes and connected with my higher self. What was I feeling? All of a sudden, I knew that I was in close proximity to a powerful beast. I could feel the auric field of the animal, and sense its powerful presence that seemed more formidable than that of Tiger Lily. How was that even possible, I wondered. I stood very still and tried to note the brush that had been recently pressed down, clearly by big feet that somehow seemed bipedal. I also detected a faint musty odour, a smell I would associate more with camels with a slight sulphurous overtone. I closed my eyes again and knew immediately where the animal was, that the auric field was so strong that it bedazzled me and wrapped itself around a tree, and the energy was awe-consuming. The critter knew at once I had perceived his presence, and he stepped out into my field of vision and stared at me with deep-set dark eyes. I realised in absolute amazement that I was staring at the hairy giant my grandfather had always talked about, or Bigfoot in our terminology. Then suddenly I heard the words in my head, "'This is my forest. What are you doing here?' I amazed the critter by answering him back in my mind. And the first thing he said to me is, You can hear me? Of course, I said. What are you doing in my forest? he asked. I was returning a fawn to its mother, I told him. The Bigfoot looked surprised. I'm not normally impressed by your kind, he said in my mind. Your kind brings so much trouble. May the forest bless you for your kindness. The critter then walked away and I stood there for a moment, hardly daring to believe what had just transpired. I had not only seen a Bigfoot, but conversed with him too. I mean, how did that happen? It had happened so briefly, and only a moment in time, but meeting the mythical legendary Bigfoot my grandfather had told me all about, the hairy giant that lives in the mountains, was a monumental event in my life that left a lasting impressionable memory on me. The creature that I discerned was seven foot tall, five hundred pounds and three foot across the chest, I noted was covered with silver-grey hair, 
and had greenish golden eyes and a dome-shaped head. I thought his body was lean but powerful. He walked away, moving his legs in a fluid motion, and his arms swayed backwards and forwards, rather like a marching soldier. When I first saw his expression, he looked disenchanted like a grumpy father whom had become tired about his kid's bad behaviour. I could sense he wasn't impressed with our kind, but his attitude changed when I talked to him telepathically. In the past few years, I've heard so many terrifying Bigfoot accounts, one after another, and it leads me to examine our species and wonder what it is that we've done to cause such discord among the hairy men of the mountains. Does an angry father strike his son for no reason at all? It is likely that the boy provoked him to anger. Could we have provoked Bigfoot in the ways we behave in the wood, with all our ransacking of the forests, our overhunting, and sometimes belligerent behaviour of our species. Before we judge the hairy critters of the woods, should we not examine ourselves first? For my Navajo roots have shown me, for the most part, that the hairy men were benign and benevolent. What have we done to aggrieve them? So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Lydia, and I'm from the evergreen state known as Washington, which is situated in the Pacific Northwest and is bordered by British Columbia and Canada to the north, Idaho to the east, Oregon to the south, and the Pacific Ocean to the west. I'm from Tacoma, which is a city in Washington State on the banks of Puget Sound, south of Seattle, and I live here in a very attractive neighbourhood in Eastside Enact, which has incredible views over Mount Rainier and exquisite local parks in the area, with the added advantage of being close to downtown with all the local shops and delicious eateries. I reside here in a green leafy neighbourhood in a very small, charming sage green craftsman style home with a dark brown roof, double hung windows and a traditional covered porch. My story begins in 2016 when I was 22 years old at the time. That was when I decided to acquire a female lodger to help share some of the household expenses which made sense to me from a financial perspective as my house, although small and quaint, was rather on the large size for one person to manage all on their own. Before long, I found the quintessential perfect tenant and housemate called Grace, who worked as an aspiring young nurse at a children's cancer hospital. I loved how unflappable she was, and from the moment I met her, she wore her heart on the sleeve and was a good-natured, cheery, convivial and passionate person. She possessed a soft Irish accent and told me once that working in the cancer ward with young patients had made her come to the realisation of how precious life is and how we should value every moment that we have on the earth plane. I used to listen to the most remarkable stories that she would share with me of the courage and bravery that these young kids with cancer exhibited along their tumultuous, turbulent and challenging journey with this less than agreeable disease. It's almost like these plucky kids are teaching us about guts and fortitude and not the other way round, she told me once. I also learnt that there were times when young children claimed to see angels and deceased family members when they were very close to death. Sometimes Grace would return home from a hard day's work at the children's hospital with a sombre, doleful look on her face, and I could discern tears clouding her pretty hazel eyes. I knew better than to ask her why she was so grievously sad, as I imagined those were the days when she'd lost a much-loved patient to that dreadful disease. Grace owned a very large, overweight, soppy and lackadaisical, pampered grey cat called Pepper. On her days off, she loved nothing better than to sit back on the couch, watching a lovely comedy on television, while stroking Pepper's long, silky coat. He would purr profusely and park his sizable body upon her lap, always falling into a deep sleep. I think for Grace, Pepper was a welcome distraction from the emotional trauma of a job that literally tugs at the heartstrings every day. Pepper was incredibly spoilt, like no cat I know, and would literally eat poached chicken every single day, along with tuna and kibbles. And I loved Pepper almost as much as she did, because he was a laid-back and carefree cat. One day Pepper went missing, and I tried my level best to reassure Grace that he could not have gone far. But losing her cat was very difficult for her, as she loved the bones of the critter, almost as if it was her own child. It was somewhat incomprehensible for the slothful Pepper to have vanished like this, as he was never inclined to wander far, 
and tended to hang around on the porch or in the living area, as it was his nature to be idle, lazy and languorous. Something terrible happened to him, said Grace. I just feel it in my guts. Look, I said, trying to offer words of comfort and reassurance. Maybe he went off on a little adventure of his own. I do know cats can disappear and reappear weeks later. You hear all kinds of stories about that. As far as I'm concerned, no news is good news, I assured her. I do hope you're right, said Grace. It's just not like Pepper to wander off far. A week later, on a sunny morning, Pepper appeared in the kitchen, rubbing his long coat against my legs and purring profusely. And although eager for some food, he acted as if he had never ever been away. I know most people would have sent an SMS or phoned Grace, but I'm not most people. I was champing at the bit to tell Grace the amazing news face to face and share in the utter joy that Pepper was now safe and sound and preening himself on the couch at home after tucking into a sizable portion of poached chicken. I had never been to Grace's place of work before, and I was not altogether prepared for what I would encounter. I eagerly parked my car in the parking lot under the shade of a large oak tree and ventured through the glass doors of this sterile, clinical, and salubrious looking hospital. And after receiving directions from a friendly lady in the reception area as to where I would find Grace, I diligently made my way to the cancer ward. As I went past, I briefly looked into one of the wards in passing, possibly more out of curiosity than anything else. A young, bald headed girl with a white skin and blue eyes. Was sitting up in her hospital bed against a pile of puffed up pillows close to the door. She looked up at me with bright, warm, cheerful, friendly eyes, and for a moment our eyes locked. Don't go, she called after me. Please don't go. I really could do with a friend right now. It can get lonely in here at times. I took a few steps back and came into the girl's ward. The girl pointed to a chair beside her bed, and I obediently sat down. Please don't look sorry for me, said the girl. I hate it when I see the pity in people's eyes. I'm dying, I have brain cancer, and I've got six months to live, and I'm fine with that. Really, I said. You're not frightened of dying? The girl laughed. Why do adults make such a big deal about death? You close your eyes, and then you're out of here. What's so dreadful about that? You're very brave, I admitted. I don't think in your shoes I'd be so strong. Or feel like you do. Well, it's a good job that I'm the one with cancer and not you, giggled the girl. My name is Charlotte, by the way. What's yours? I'm Lydia, I said. I'm very pleased to meet you, Charlotte. I've never ever met anyone with cancer before. I'm no different than the next kid, said the girl. I've just got cancer, that's all. Otherwise, we're pretty much exactly the same. Nothing different, really. How are your parents dealing with your diagnosis? I asked hesitantly. Already knowing the answer to that question. It's awful, said Charlotte. I hate it when they visit me, because I can see how broken up they are inside. They look at me with such piteous, defeated expressions on their face. I'm the one that has to comfort them. It's not the other way around. Well, I said, it's always the ones left behind that struggle with death the most. I imagine your parents are terrified of losing you. I know I would be in their shoes. I hate to imagine what they must be going through. What's that? I asked suddenly, looking at a teddy bear lying in Charlotte's arms, with the longest arms that I've ever seen before. Boy, that's a funny looking teddy bear, I said, if ever I saw one. It's not a teddy bear, said Charlotte. It's my Bigfoot. Oh, Bigfoot, I laughed, not knowing quite what to say to that. I mean, who chooses Bigfoot over a teddy bear to cuddle? But this girl clearly did. You're not a believer, chuckled Charlotte. I can see the doubt in your eyes. Don't worry, most people are like you, highly cynical of all matters related to Bigfoot. My parents are the greatest scoffers of all. They really don't approve of my obsession with the critter. Sorry, I confessed. I really would like to believe. Believe me, I would. But I assure you, if such a critter was actually real, we would have more evidence by now and tangible proof. Oh, but they are real, said Charlotte. When I was about five years old, a female Bigfoot would watch me playing in the backyard with my dolls. We live next door to the National Forest, you see. She was really lovely. I still remember her beautiful golden eyes. Sometimes when I lie back in my hospital bed, I visualize her and see her as clearly as I did when I was five years old. 
You remember that? I asked in amazement. I can't remember anything when I was five years old. Are you sure it wasn't a bear or something you actually saw? Very sure, said the girl. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm certain I'm communicating with her at times. She speaks to me in my head in the hospital. She's so comforting and reassuring. She keeps telling me that death is no different than leaving one room behind and entering another. That's an interesting perspective, I said, not really knowing what to say to that, as it sounded completely far-fetched to me. I mean, how could a Bigfoot speak to a young girl in a hospital bed? It was outrageously crazy. I need to ask you a favour, said Charlotte, sitting up in the bed. Suddenly she looked excited. I want you to visit the National Park at the back of my home, because the female Bigfoot has something she wants to give me. I think you're the right person to ask for the job. As you can imagine, when Charlotte asked me such a bizarre favour, I wasn't inclined to refuse her. I mean, who in their right mind says no to a young, dying cancer patient with only months left to live? I was certainly not going to decline her exuberant request. I remember leaving that hospital, wondering how on earth I was going to manage this farcical outlandish favour without breaking the poor girl's heart in the process. Indeed, I was so concerned about this that I almost forgot to tell Grace the great news that Pepper had been found safe and well. That's incredible, sighed Grace happily, giving me a huge hug. It's so kind of you to come all this way just to tell me. The naughty little scoundrel. I wonder what he's been up to. I can't wait to see him when I get back, she said. I must admit it was priceless to observe the joyous expression on Grace's attractive, heart-shaped face as she wiped tears of relief away from her hazel eyes. That evening I prepared spaghetti carbonara for dinner while Grace was fussing over Pepper. Where did you get to, boy? she scolded him. I thought we'd lost you for good. After I opened a bottle of wine for us to share during dinner, I confided in Grace about my curious dilemma. Oh, you met Charlotte, she said. She's a lovely, quirky character, isn't she? Yes, she is, I said. I really like her. But she's asked me to go to the National Forest and wait for a female Bigfoot to hand me something to give to her. Grace laughed. I told you she was quirky. Well, what should I do, I asked. Humour her, said Grace. I honestly don't see what else you can do. Telling her a white lie isn't a big deal, if it's for the greater good. I'd tell her that you went to the forest and a female Bigfoot gave you a pine cone to give her. That will make her happy. That's a great idea, I said, feeling heartily relieved. You do know Charlotte rarely believes a female Bigfoot is actually speaking to her in her mind. She's convinced that at age five it would watch her playing in the backyard. She tells me she remembers it vividly. Well, you know, kids, laughed Grace. They have fertile, inventive imaginations. She must have made the story up in her head, because Bigfoot is just a fictional character. We all know that. The following afternoon I visited Grace in the hospital, and she looked downcast. You didn't go to the forest, did you, she said, looking at me with a sullen, disappointed expression upon her face. Oh, I did, I lied. I saw the female Bigfoot, and she gave me this pine cone to give you. Why are you lying, said Grace, taking the pine cone from me and placing it on her bed. I never thought she were a liar. You never went to the forest, did you? Mystic Mountain never saw you. Who's Mystic Mountain, I asked, looking perturbed. The female Bigfoot that speaks to me in my head. I can't pronounce her real name, but her name means Mystic Mountain, which is what I call her. For a moment I didn't know what to say, as I felt like a kid that had been caught with my hand in the cookie jar. How did this young eleven-year-old girl know that I was lying to her? Was I such a bad liar? Why do adults think kids are so stupid, sighed Charlotte. Tell me if you really saw Mystic Mountain, what did she look like, she challenged me. Well, I said, glancing over at the Bigfoot teddy bear. It had very long arms, and was covered in reddish hair, and it was big. You see, I told you, said Charlotte. You didn't see Mystic Mountain. She doesn't have red hair. All right, I confess, I lied. But I don't believe in Bigfoot, so I didn't see any point in going to that forest for you. I never asked you to believe, said Charlotte. I asked you to visit the forest. That's all you need to do for me. Is that so hard to do? I just don't want to disappoint you, I said. I'd hate to do that. Charlotte reached out to touch my hand and squeezed it tightly. You'll only disappoint me if you don't go, she said. So fast forward a week or so, and I was attired in walking clothes with a bottle of water, ready to embark on this crazy adventure 
just to humour a highly intelligent, perceptive girl in a cancer ward. I realised I couldn't fob her off with an avalanche of excuses, because this girl was as sharp and astute as a bald eagle. I just felt a desolate sadness in my heart that this little escapade was going to be entirely fruitless. I knew that Bigfoot was definitely no more real than Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. I must admit it was a beautiful sunny day, and I knew a little light exercise would do me a world of good. I was one of those people that always had good intentions and would try out a gym for a week or so, never to return again. It was crazy that I lived in Washington and barely ever went hiking. I was glad to see there was not many people around, as there was only one other car in the parking bay. I put on my sneakers and followed the long hiking trail into the woods, and I don't know what it was about these evergreen shaded retreats, but they're so uplifting, energising and invigorating to the spirit. The arresting forest was full of western hemlocks, Douglas firs, Pacific yews and white bark pines that towered up into the sky like regal skyscrapers, with moss literally hanging from tree branches like lush verdant curtains, and the dirt trail was surrounded by frilly, delicate leafy ferns, interesting-looking fungi, lily of the valley and wild ginger. I also marvelled at the way the light from the forest canopy filtered through the trees, basking the ground in a variegated ethereal light. It was so enchanting and bewitching, much like a fairy tale. My thoughts were far away from my mission at hand, as I was so mesmerised by the resplendence of this idyllic oasis. Suddenly I heard a pretty whistle, which I imagined was a bird of some kind, and I started glancing up into the branches of a tree to look for the bird, but I saw nothing. The whistling stopped, and I proceeded along the path, when I suddenly got the overwhelming feeling that I was being watched, which instinctively put my nerves on edge, and sent a creepy chill down my spine. I looked around, but nothing was there, but I did detect a very pleasant pine-like smell that seemed to come and go like a wafting, lingering perfume. The path veered up to the steep incline that was rocky and very picturesque, and I began to enjoy the sounds of the pretty bird song with the tweets and warbles that filled the air with pretty music. I encountered several ruffled grouse pecking away at the ground, and noted a couple of snowshoe hares hopping around the woodland area, seemingly unfrazed by my presence, which was a surprise, as I was used to indigenous wildlife being rather skittish of me. I really got the sense that something or someone was trailing me, because I was certain I could hear heavy feet crunching leaf litter behind me, but when I stopped, so did they. I shrugged my shoulders and proceeded along my way, and then the whistling began all over again. I stopped dead in my tracks and scanned the branches of the tree. I was desperate to locate the mysterious bird that could whistle so perfectly, but once again I saw nothing. Suddenly I remembered my mission at hand, and why of course I was in the woods in the first place, and I recall thinking that in the very least I should bring something from the woods to appease Charlotte. At least it would prove that I had been here, and I had tried my level best to follow her bidding. I knew this time I was not going to lie to her, as Charlotte could see through me like a mirror. I began scanning the forest floor for pine cones to gather. I knew that at the very least I needed to bring Charlotte some evidence of my walk in the wood. That was when I instinctively got the sense that someone was watching me. I could see moss from about eight feet off the ground being pulled away by these large dark hands much like a curtain. I saw this leathery human-like face staring at me, and then the outlandish creature climbed through the brush and approached me cautiously on a pair of long, slender, powerful legs. She had overlong arms that she swung backwards and forwards as she moved. I was so shocked because this could not be real. It was not even remotely possible, surely not. I was staring at a female Bigfoot. I froze to the spot, so overwhelmed by consternation, so much so that I think my fear was momentarily suppressed. Imagine for a moment that you suddenly encounter something you never believe existed. It has a profound effect of shattering your reality, like a mirror, into thousands of little glassy shards, and making you question everything you thought you knew. It also makes you hauntingly aware how little you do actually know and that the world is not quite as you perceived it to be. I stood still, not moving a muscle. Was this an illusion, I wondered, or a crazy dream that I was about to wake up from? The female Bigfoot stood there very still, almost as if she appreciated and even sensed my wondrous awe, and my amazement. I think my eyes must have been as round as saucers, and my mouth hanging to the ground agog. 
Not for a moment did any feelings of fear overtake me in a way that they should have done, because this Bigfoot was so intimidating, formidable, powerful, strong and majestic, and if she had wanted to wring my neck, she could have snapped it like a chicken, as such was her power and strength. I could see the critter was exceedingly tall. I think she was well over eight foot, and possibly seven hundred pounds and four feet across the shoulders, and she was covered in light brown hair, which was more sparse under her arms, around her breasts and on her knees, and she had very little hair upon her face. I did discern that the leathery weathered skin on her face was the golden colour of untanned leather. I also noted her deep-set intelligent eyes were also golden, She had a large flat nose, a furrowed brow ridge, and thin lips. I was so overwhelmed and transfixed by her Goliath's size, which was quite frankly mind-boggling, and this was intensified by the appearance of dense muscle mass that highlighted her substantial girth. I perceived that she possessed the largest shoulders that I've ever seen, and a pyramid-shaped head that just merged into the shoulders, seamlessly without any neck to speak of. I could tell the reticent, shy, rather evasive critter was exceedingly outside her comfort zone and seemed hesitant as she approached me. That was when I realised that she was handing me something in her large hands. I reached out to receive it, and then the critter just turned around and glided away, moving in a way that was so fluid she looked like she was floating, and she was as fast and as graceful as a cheetah, and I marvelled at what I had beheld. I stood there, hardly daring to believe what had just happened. I immediately began to examine the stone that she had given me. It just looked like a speckled ordinary river stone, but I knew that whatever it was, Charlotte wanted it. I remember returning to my car and sitting in the front seat for a very long time until someone finally tapped my window, which I wound down. "'Are you all right, ma'am? You've been parked here for a very long time in your car. Is your car running all right?' Oh, would you like some help? I looked at my watch, appalled, realising I'd been staring into space for three long hours. I'm fine, I said, starting up the engine and driving away. Looking back, I must have been so bedazzled and beguiled by what I'd seen. I possibly sat in my car in a trance-like state, trying to absorb it all. I just think I couldn't grasp the shocked revelation that Bigfoot was indeed real. I realised that maybe Charlotte had really connected to this creature— How on earth could she communicate with it all the way in her hospital bed? It made no sense to me at all. Did did Bigfoot have outer-worldly abilities, I wondered? It seemed likely that this must be the case. The next morning, as I approached Charlotte's bed, I could see a jubilant sparkle in her eyes. You saw Mystic Mountain, she said, didn't you? I told you she was real, but you didn't believe me, did you? I don't understand any of it, Charlotte. None of this makes sense to me. But yes, I think I saw her. The trouble with adults is they complicate everything, said Charlotte. Did you bring me the stone she gave you? How do you know it's a stone, I asked, looking at Charlotte in astonishment. Mystic Mountain told me it's a stone Bigfoots keep close to them when they die. It helps with the transition process, you see, or the crossing over. It makes it easier. This is all beyond me, I said. I don't understand any of it. None of it makes any sense to me at all. I think I just preferred the world when I thought I knew everything. You don't have to understand, said Charlotte, laughing. You just have to trust and believe. That's all. It's called faith. In the weeks and months that followed, I visited Charlotte three times a week, and she rarely warmed the cockles of my heart. I couldn't make any sense of my Bigfoot encounter or Charlotte being able to connect with the critter in such a profound telepathic way that bordered on the incredulous, but I knew better than to doubt her story, for I had seen the Bigfoot myself, and now I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Bigfoot was real. I remember Charlotte began to deteriorate rapidly during the final weeks of her life, and became painfully thin and emaciated, and her skin began to look as white and fragile as paper. I knew she was in terrible pain, and it was very difficult to watch her suffer like this, although they did increase the morphine. I would still visit her and read her books by the bedside. One day she awoke to what I can only describe was a golden hour, and she began to talk and talk like old times. For a moment I thought she'd experienced a miraculous recovery, but the nurse just nudged me and said, "'Enjoy the time you have left with her. It won't be long now.' 
but she's so much better, I protested. The nurse repeated, go and spend some time with her. She hasn't got much time left. I had no idea where her parents were, but I heard that her mother had an emotional breakdown on the way to the hospital. I'm going today, Charlotte informed me, in such a nonchalant way, as if she was talking about the weather. Mystic Mountain told me that I'm going today. I held Charlotte's hand. I don't want you to go, I said, the tears filling my eyes. I really don't. I've grown so attached to you. Charlotte gave me her Bigfoot teddy bear and the black stone. I want you to keep them, she said. You have been like a best friend to me. I will always love you, like I love Mystic Mountain. I will treasure them, I said, wiping away tears, and I will also miss you. I won't be far from you, and if I can visit you, I will. And that's a promise, she said, giving me a gentle squeeze. How will I know it's you, I asked. I'll come to you as a robin, she said. I've always liked robins. If you see a robin behaving strangely, that will be me. Later that day, Charlotte died, and I was totally and utterly devastated. But I did find the Bigfoot bear and the black stone brought me a measure of comfort, and I put them in pride of place on my mantle, and for weeks I had to avoid looking at them, as it was all I could do to break down into tears and sob and sob. But now, when I look at them, I'm able to smile. When Grace saw that Charlotte had given me her Bigfoot teddy bear, she was utterly astonished. She must have loved you a lot to give you that, she said. I know how attached and possessive she was over that bear. One day, as Charlotte and I were in the kitchen, we saw a robin sitting on a tree branch, staring in at us in the kitchen. It seemed so tame, and was not in the least bit skittish, and it stayed on that branch for ten long minutes, just looking in at us. It was utterly extraordinary. I could hardly believe it. I've never seen a robin behave like that, said Grace. How strange. I never said anything to Grace, but I knew that the robin was from Charlotte. It's been over a couple of years since Charlotte died, and I miss her terribly. I still don't understand how I got to encounter a Bigfoot in this curious, bizarre, outlandish way, but I'm in no doubt what I saw. I want to assure you that I've never shared this story with anyone, not even Grace, but I assure you every word of it is true, as astonishing and as far-fetched as it sounds. So there you are. That's my story. Do you know that that is the most gorgeous story? I just loved it. It really brought tears to my eyes. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus, and I really do hope you enjoyed it, because that's the whole idea about it, is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, goodbye and good night. <laughs>